Hi, I'm Zarmina Niazi, a product marketer at Fivetran. I focus on our marketing analytics use cases, and today we'll dive into what the death of the cookie means for marketing analytics and how that'll impact retailers in the future. Before we dive in, let's level set for a moment. We've been hearing a lot of buzz about the death of the cookie in the last few months, but we can actually trace the downfall of third-party cookies back to 2017. In digital marketing terms, five years is a long time. A combination of governmental and technical factors, as well as public sentiment, has fueled where we're at today. So let's look at the context. In 2017, Safari, which is owned by Apple, released ITP, their anti-tracking technology baked into Safari settings. This was really the first hint at user privacy control in browser. In 2018, GDPR went into effect in the EU and EEA, which affected online data protection and privacy and had implications for advertising targeting. It left companies kind of scrambling to make sure that they were compliant. At the same time in the US, Facebook and Google CEOs testified about user privacy in front of Congress. And in 2019, both Firefox and Safari released a feature that blocked third-party cookies by default, effectively killing third-party cookies on their browsers. Meanwhile, the FTC fined Facebook over $5 billion for its scandal with Cambridge Analytica, where about 87 million Facebook accounts were mined for personal user data to use for political advertising. And in 2020, CCPA went into effect, which gave Californians the right to opt out of the sale of personal data. This year, Apple has just updated its Identifier for Advertisers, or IDFA, to require user opt-in. That basically means every time a user downloads an app at the App Store, they are prompted to allow or not allow tracking. Early results are coming in and they're reporting back that less than 14% of users are opting into tracking. And with the largest nail in the coffin, Google Chrome plans to phase out third-party cookies on its browser in 2022. But they have announced that this change will actually change in 2023. It still leaves us discussing the state of cookies today. And if so many different factors over the years have contributed to the deprecation of third-party cookies, why is it so important right now? Google's uh, announcement to get rid of third-party cookies in Chrome earlier this year just happened, so it's really top of mind. And more importantly, it's because they have the largest, largest market share for browser use worldwide. So when Firefox and Safari updated their browsers in 2019, sure, there were definitely impacts, but really not as wide scale since their market share globally is not as high. It's anticipated that Google Chrome's update will have much more widespread impact. When we talk about the death of the cookie, a nuance that's sometimes lost is that there are really two different kinds of cookies. You may have heard me say it, that the death of the cookie is about third-party cookies, but another kind of cookie exists, and that's first-party cookies. So what's the difference? Let's say I visit TechCrunch online to read a couple articles. Like a lot of other websites, TechCrunch uses advertising slots to monetize their business. So when the page loads, the third parties whose ads are on the site can create a cookie and they save it to my computer. They can see if I interact with their ads, they can typically see where else I go online. And that's because TechCrunch didn't create this cookie, it's owned by the third parties who created it. A recent study reported that at any given time, 90 different organizations can drop a cookie on a single site that a user visits. First party cookies are a little bit different. Let's say I visit TechCrunch.com again. TechCrunch themselves can drop a cookie and save it to my computer too. They can see how I'm engaging with their website as a consumer. These cookies are generally considered essential to using a website and are a one one-to-one -one transaction between a business and the consumer. While third-party cookies start to fall out of favor, you're going to see a call for data that's created by first-party cookies. And that's because first-party data is unlikely to ever go away. It's a direct relationship with your website visitors and will quickly become the most valuable data point you have to understand your customers. <clears throat> While there are many different ways that marketing analytics may be impacted by this shift, I wanted to touch on three major points. These are changes like lower ROI, mini walled gardens, and data retention. Though third-party cookies have only existed for about 20 years or so, the industry really capitalized on them right away, and now they're a huge part of a marketer's tools. Marketing departments and agencies that rely really heavily on targeting fueled by third-party data should brace themselves to see some volatility with their key performance metrics, 
especially ROI. And why is that? Simply put, it's just going to be harder to target the right kind of customer as specifically as third, car third party cookie targeting does today. If you're marketing to irrelevant customers, your revenue is expected to drop. This was clear even in 2019 when Google ran an experiment with a small group of its ads manager customers. They turned off third party cookies for them and ad revenue dropped by about 52%. In the future, Google's privacy sandbox will account for some of these changes, and you shouldn't see it as large of an ROI drop. But benchmarks for ROI, I'm still expecting will decrease. If you're used to getting a very consistent 5 to 1 or 3 to 1 return, expect to see those numbers shift. When this goes into effect, it is not the time to launch a brand new product. Your marketing team will be busy making sure that the existing metrics and existing product lines are performing. Make sure you also work with your merchandise planning teams so that they're aware of potential impacts. And in general, prepare your executive teams to understand that your marketers will need to come up with new and creative way to attract customers. Next, we're all familiar at this point with the concept of walled gardens, which is what the industry refers to as platforms that have a lot of proprietary data to power their advertising structures that don't necessarily speak to other platforms. We predict more of the industry will actually continue in this direction, creating these mini walled gardens across publishers and vendors. It's anticipated that they'll rely on their own logged in user data to create their own deterministic ID models for their platforms. The divides from platform to platform will deepen lines and it'll make cross platform attribution more of a minefield than it already is. The number of tools that you're using may increase. What retail marketers should be cautious of here is there's going to be a lot of tools with a lot of technologies and everyone's going to be talking about it. Don't use this as a time to invest in more marketing tools. Instead, work with your analytics team to look at the data and validate the tools you're already using, like the advertising platforms and email marketing tools that you're already using. Make sure they work and bring strong returns and will continue to work. Also, take a page out of everyone else's book and consider building your own single sign-on or logged in users and incentivize customers to create accounts to better market to them. Another impact to watch out for is that data retention will change. This isn't only because of the death of third-party cookies. This is honestly going to happen because public sentiment has come to value privacy more and more and put public pressure on big name players to address this shift. For example, in the new Google Analytics called Google Analytics 4, retention of user level data is fixed at either two or 14 months. That also includes conversion data. We expect to see similar changes coming down the line to other major advertising platforms where retention will be limited. Without historical marketing data, it's gonna be hard to use predictive analytics to determine seasonal budgets and performance. Retailers especially need to keep an eye here. But don't panic and try to download a bunch of spreadsheets and save them to your computer. It's not scalable and it's definitely prone to human error. Instead, start looking at a modern data stack to extract the data from all your favorite marketing platforms and store it in your cloud-based warehouse. You can later use that data to see whatever you need to in the future. That leads me to my next point. What is a modern data stack and why might it be helpful for some of these changes? At Fivetran, I work with marketers and analysts who are looking at marketing data on a near daily basis. And they do this by using a modern data stack. It starts with all the SaaS tools and applications you already use to do your job. Think Google Ads, Facebook Ads, Shopify, Marketo. Instead of manually looking at the data within each platform or through spreadsheets downloaded from these platforms, you pump it all into a single cloud data warehouse like Snowflake or BigQuery and create insights with your BI tool like Looker, Looker or Tableau. With always on access to your marketing data, a modern data stack can help your marketing and analytics team future-proof for industry changes that will impact your retail and marketing data ecosystem. Thanks for listening, and if you'd like to learn more, visit us at fivetran.com.